In today's episode, we are going over a case study of an individual that underwent hip labral repair. We're going to be talking about their rehab from week zero all the way up to month three. Let's get going. First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, a coach, a personal trainer, and I am a meathead. I love all things fitness and weight training. This is a fitness pain-free show where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please consider leaving a positive review. Helps me out tremendously. And if you want to go that next step to really support the channel, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain for Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. I think Netflix, but for coaches and physical therapists. It's got premium uh, content that's been updated every month for years, about five so far. Uh, it's all been updated by me. You've got over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides a private Facebook group where you can ask any questions and you can also decide upcoming podcast topics. You can get started for just $1. After that, it's $12.99 per month. Like I said, it's the best way to support me and it's an absolute no brainer if you want to try to continue your education. Uh, so go ahead and click on fitnesspainfree.com, go on the programs tab, and then click on fitness pain free insiders online library. I'll also leave a link in the show notes if you want to click on it from there. So who's the patient that we're talking about today? Well, it's a 20 year old male and uh, I'm actually still treating him. We're almost done with his stay because he's going to be leaving soon to go back to school. And he's a baseball player. He's a very high level baseball player. Uh, so he, he competes at Division One University. And the other part is that he is a pitcher. And that's also going to be very relevant when you start talking about our rehab towards the later stages of rehab. His competitive season is in the spring of 2023. And he returns to school at the end of the summer, around week 12, which we're almost at right now in terms of his rehabilitation. So I don't really know how the next three months or so are going to go because we haven't gotten there yet, right? I'm sure they'll, they'll go pretty well. I'm not concerned. He's doing great at this time. And then his practice is going to start up as soon as he returns for the most part. And again, that's just important for our long-term planning here because we want to make sure he doesn't get back to anything too soon. We also make sure he's in good hands when he makes that transition back to school. So what's the subjective information for this patient? Well, for one, about a year ago, he showed up to our office and he had left-sided groin pain and he injured this running and it was bugging him a bit, but it really got flared up to the point where he's like, I need to see someone when he was doing some running work uh, at practice. And it was diagnosed with athletic pubalgia. I was the one who diagnosed him and it seemed like his adductor longus was most irritated. We're actually pretty lucky because we were able to, to rehab it quite well when he was able to get back to everything, which is pretty cool. And a little bit later on, towards the end of his season, he got a sharp pain in the left side groin again in the front part of the hip while pitching. Uh, it was very sharp and sudden onset, and it scared him a lot. He ended up going to the physician at that point. He was able to get through his season with a corazon shot to the hip. But afterwards, he ended up getting some imaging, and lo and behold, he did have a hip labral tear. Right, His tear is a little bit uh, unique because there's an anterior inferior tear, and the majority of these are more anterior superior. And he did have a big cam deformity to go along with it. So what else is important to know about this athlete? For one, he's got a pretty extensive training age, about as long as you can have for a 20-year-old. Uh, he was one of those individuals that got involved in strength and conditioning from a very young age. He had a lot of good influences when it came to exercise technique and programming and all that stuff. Uh, he's a very talented athlete. He's very gifted, right? And that is actually going to affect rehab quite a bit because when he starts to do his strengthening and conditioning uh, that's associated with his rehab, he's going to pick it up really quickly. And he did, as we'll see a bit later. Uh, and I think that also influenced the rate of progression. So if you are folks a little bit more green that haven't been lifting for quite as long, uh, they have a tougher time progressing into the strength conditioning. Uh, if you were used to doing it prior to surgery, it makes that a lot easier. And obviously this guy's got years and years of this, which helped him out. His ultimate goals are A, to reduce his pain, right? No brainer. Uh, but really he wants to get back to pitching. And he's one of those guys that competes at a very high level. So he would be interested in competing at a pro level if he's able to over the course of time. So I'm a big fan of getting the post-operative report. For all your patients that just had a surgery, okay, uh, you'd be really surprised sometimes if folks don't really know the type of surgery they've had, and they certainly aren't going to know the nuances are going to be really important from a rehab perspective. 
So just going through the post-op report for this patient, he had a large cam deformity. Uh, the doc didn't note how big that is. Oftentimes, they'll talk about the alpha, an excuse me, alpha angle, and they'll also talk about how much the, uh, the excuse me, alpha angle was reduced after surgery. But there was none of that within this note. I don't think we needed to know that. He just said that it was a quite sizable, in quotations, cam lesion, right? And in terms of the actual labral repair, he used one anchor, and it was an anterior inferior tear, and he said it was an excellent repair, okay? Uh, he also noted there was a partial labrectomy of the lateral labrum, so a little additional injury to the lateral portion of the labrum, not enough to repair it. They just trimmed off some of that tissue, right? Uh, this is important because if, if the surgeon is saying there was an excellent repair, that's a good sign the tissue quality was probably pretty good. It was a type of labral tear that was easily repaired. And then when the uh, surgeon repaired it, he was happy with the way it went. Okay. And all that's good as a sign moving forward. So if you have multiple anchors, right, or the repair wasn't quite as good noted by the surgeon, and oftentimes you might have to go a little slower with your rehab, right? The other uh, part was very important is that there's no microfracture with this surgery. Okay. Now in folks that have FAI and potential labral pathology, oftentimes have cartilage damage to go along with it. Okay. Now there was a bit of cartilage damage in the MRI earlier on with this patient. However, the doctor didn't feel like it was a big deal and they did not have to do a microfracture surgery. And if you don't know what a microfracture surgery it is, in the hip labral repair, if they notice there's enough cartilage damage and they want to try to repair some of that cartilage, they'll poke a few holes in the bone, right? The bone will bleed and that actually forms some new cartilage. Uh, the reason why this is important is because if you have a microfracture procedure, you're going to be non-weight bearing for a longer period of time after surgery. And that just delays everything, sometimes up to four to six weeks difference from a person that has a microfracture to not having a microfracture, okay? So no microfracture in this case, Rehab's going to be a little faster. So what were some of the objective findings in this case? Well, for one, physical therapy started at week two, okay? Uh, I have a local surgeon that I like quite a bit, and this patient was not from that surgeon, but the local surgeon I like and trust, he refers patients over immediately after surgery. So it's not uncommon for me to see someone less than 24 hours out from a surgery, but generally these folks are trying to get in sometime somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. Now, this patient actually saw at week two, which is a bit slow. Um, but in all honesty, he had great range of motion, and I was not worried in the slightest bit. So he ended up doing quite well, despite me not seeing him earlier on. So I saw him at week two for the first visit. A couple things we take note of at the first visit. Are there any signs of infection or DVT? Are the incisions dry and healing? Okay. The other part is that we want to actually educate the patient about these things and make sure if they're starting to see that, they know what that means and they know they need to go back to the doctor to figure out what's going on, right? Unfortunately, every so often, one of these individuals will end up getting uh, a DVT. Uh, I had one individual with hip labral uh, tear. He had it repaired and he was having swelling and pain within his thigh. And I actually did send him to emergency room and he did actually end up, uh, end up having a, a DVT, so... Make sure that you're on the lookout for that early on. Um, usually you don't have this problem, but we're always keeping that in the back of our mind, right? Uh, checking his range of motion. His range of motion was phenomenal. And I actually noticed this from most of my patients. So after you have this type of surgery, usually you're going to have range of motion restrictions. For this individual, we were limited in flexion, abduction, and rotation, and extension, pretty much all the motions, right? Uh, but the motions we were allowed to utilize he got to no problem. Okay. He was able to get the 90 degrees of flexion. He was able to have 20 to 30 degrees of internal rotation and external rotation, 20 degrees of abduction. And it felt like an empty end feel. So we probably could have gone further if we needed to. Okay. Another note is that one of the reasons why you'll see these folks often uh, limited with hip flexion and also abduction is because that's going to protect the labral fixation. If you think about where this individual's uh, tear was, it was in the front bottom anterior inferior. So if we do abduction or if we extend the hip, it's going to stretch that surgical fixation, right? And if I go into a straight plane flexion or internal rotation, I'm going to compress that area, okay? So we're staying away from those ranges just to protect that healing site, okay? So what did the protocol look like for this individual? 
Well, first and foremost, I am a little bit fearful of talking about protocol specifics just because I think it's really important that you listen to the surgeon and you have good clinical reasoning when you're progressing your patients. You're not just doing whatever the heck you feel like doing. All right. So make sure you consult with the surgeon, figure out what they think is important moving forward and don't extend beyond that. If you have questions about why they're doing something so early on or why they're delaying something, then bring that up to the surgeon. But I really don't think it's appropriate that you just go willy nilly and do whatever you like. Okay. With that being said, Sports Health had a pretty good article entitled Physical Therapy Protocol After Hip Arthroscopy. And that was from DOMB Dome et al. And what's really neat about this study is that they had individuals that had hip labral repair and they followed a certain rehab protocol. And they looked at their outcomes two years later, and they actually had pretty good outcomes, right? So this is a pretty cool protocol in my mind, not only because it's got a great progression, but also because they actually validated its efficacy, all right? So if you want a specific protocol you can look into, check that out. I'll leave the link in the show notes. It's the first reference that I have, okay? So moving along, the protocol that we had in this patient that we had is that they wanted partial weight bearing for a total of six weeks right? And that was 50% 50 from the very beginning. And I'll tell you what, most of the post-op hip labor repair patients that I see are either toe touch or non-weight bearing for the first two to four weeks. All right. So 50% from the get-go is actually a decent amount. I'm not used to that as much. However, I think they're a little bit more conservative towards the end of their partial weight bearing status because they had to be partial weight bearing for six weeks, right? Most of the patients I'm working with, by about four weeks, they're now progressing to full weight bearing as tolerated, right? So this protocol was probably a little bit progressive from the start and a little conservative towards the end of weight bearing, okay? And the second part is that this individual was limited with active straight leg raise, so no active hip flexion for the first two weeks. And I'm used to surgeons that are a little bit more fearful of hip flexion, and they're limiting that for about four weeks. Uh, the reason being is if you start hammering active hip flexion towards the start of rehab, right? If the uh, patient is doing this on their own a lot, they can really aggravate the front of the, uh, excuse me, front of the hip and delay the progress over time. So as a physical therapist, what does the decision-making process look like at the start of rehab? So first and foremost, we have to do no harm, right? We're going to protect the surgical site. This tear was an anterior inferior portion of the joint. And because of that, we're limiting abduction and extension, but also all ranges for the most part. Okay. We want to be very careful with hip flexor strength because we know we can really aggravate the hip if we stretch too much to extension, right? Push flexion or internal rotation, do too much in general, or especially really do a lot of hip flexor work early on. Okay. So we want to make sure that we protect the joint early on, but all the protection early on leads to a lot of weakness. We have to make sure we restore that over the course of time, right? I am also constantly thinking about maintaining sport and physical qualities as much as possible, right? So we need to have good conditioning. We need to have good strength. We want to make sure we strengthen the upper body, contralateral limb, maintain the strength of the hip musculature as much as we possibly can without irritating this hip too much, okay? We're also going to have a slow ramp up over the course of time. I think we're all familiar with Tim Gavitt's work and the acute to chronic workload ratio. Uh, if at any point you throw too much at the individual, they're likely to get irritated or re-injured, right? So the whole rehab process, we're thinking about a very slow progression back to all the activities the athlete has to do eventually. And the other piece I think is missed with physical therapy rehabilitation oftentimes is long-term planning, okay? So we have this thought in the physical therapy world that, okay, I tore my ACL. Okay, I repaired my rotator cuff. When can I get back, right? And the answer is often, let's say, six months or nine months or 12 months, right? Uh, but here's the other part. You might not have to get back by six months, right? Maybe you have to get back by nine to 12. And you have a little bit longer runway. If that's the case, let's use that longer runway. We'll get better prepared. So we'll perform a little bit better when we get back to sport and we'll less likely get hurt, okay? So you have to start thinking about the next season the athlete is going to be competing in, whether or not it's going to be realistic for them, okay, if they should push off, when they can return, when the best time to return is, how important that season actually is, right? Is this upcoming season that important? Maybe we skip that. Maybe we focus on the following, all right? A lot of the decisions to be made, and it's going to be very specific to the individual. We'll talk a little bit later about what we did for this guy. So what's the plan of care for this patient? Well, for most of my post-operative patients, I really like to see them two times a week with physical therapy. 
and I give them a really in-depth home exercise program. And my decision making kind of goes, I will give you more physical therapy. So we may consider bumping up to three days per week, which I very rarely do. But if someone has more pain, we're trying to get that pain down via manual therapies, right? Or if they have very restricted range of motion. So there's a few post-op patients I would, right from the get-go, have them do more range of motion. So that might be a, um, a frozen shoulder or potentially a post-op elbow where we know they're prone to have a lot of stiffness. I want to hit this from the get-go and make sure that we gain that mobility back as soon as possible, right? But I think in this case, two times a week is just fine. The other piece is that I may do less physical therapy. So I may consider one time a week. If someone's making perfect progress over the course of time, let's say the range of motion is phenomenal, very little pain, they're following along in their process, and it's it's super simple and easy for them. I say, okay, we can drop down to one time a week. You're doing fine. I don't think that I necessarily need to see you, all right? Uh, and the other piece you have to think about is um, the individual's finances. So if someone doesn't have the money to see you, if they have a, a large copay, or if you're an out-of-network provider like I am, okay, you might end up changing the amount of visits you have. And the other part is that some insurance companies are only going to allow a certain amount of visits, right? So maybe we try to stretch those visits out a little bit, or maybe we try to squeeze them in because they're only allowed to have visits for a total of three months. So you want to try to use them up within a time period. Otherwise you'll lose them. Okay. So it's going to be varied based on the individual. We saw this person two times a week and I thought that was just right. So what does physical therapy treatment look like in the first three weeks, right? So one, we definitely focus on range of motion. Okay. And we make sure we stay within the protocol restrictions, which means this is going to be pretty boring, right? So you're just doing a bunch of range of motion passively. So I'm moving that hip around in all different directions and I'm keeping it within the protocol restrictions. Like I said previously, uh, I'm hitting an empty, excuse me, empty end feel in all the different directions. So I'm not pushing through any stiffness. I'm not working through a ton of pain. It's nice, simple, easy range of motion. Uh, the docs that I tend to work with they trained under Philippon out in Vail, and he's a big fan of circumduction of the hip. So basically a lot of passive range of motion and a, a circular motion of the hip right after surgery. He finds that to be quite therapeutic and it, it decreased the amount of stiffness. And I would agree. I think that's helpful. So we do that at the start. We also focus on soft tissue work through the anterior hip or the TFL and the rectus femoris. Uh, you do have to be careful because the portal holes are right in that area. So I usually don't go right over those uh, for a few weeks right after we have the surgery. I also focus on the adductors, the glute medius and the glute max. We want to try to promote range of motion in these tissues. Often they can be quite sore after they've had hip labor repair. So it's really beneficial to reduce some of the pain the patients are experiencing. And the last piece is just education, right? Patients need to know what the restrictions are. Patients need to know what's okay and what's not okay from a pain perspective. So I don't want that anterior hip to start getting more and more and more sore. So if patients are experiencing the soreness, starting to get out of control, okay, you're going to expect some soreness. Obviously, you just had surgery, but if it's starting to get ahead of us, we have to be aware of that and start to back off, okay? So what does our strength work, uh, excuse me, what does our strength work look like initially? So for one, he's partial weight bearing. So we're not doing any loaded squats, right? We're not doing any loaded deadlifts or anything along those lines, we're also avoiding active hip flexion within the first two weeks. Okay. So we're a little bit restricted in what we can do. All right. Well, what do we start with? Mostly table work and mostly working with just your body weight. Okay. And that starts off with different isometrics. So think about glute sets, quad sets, just flexing those muscles, ankle pumps early on. We start to do clams, reverse clams, bridging and adduction work. All right. Don't forget the adductors. And once we're able to do a little bit of hip flexion, we start with things like heel slides, but we have to go nice and easy initially. Okay. I'm also a big fan of standing hip abduction and extension. So basically standing on the non-surgical leg and moving that surgical leg into abduction and extension. I also want to think about strengthening the accessory muscles as much as we possibly can. Keep in mind, you have someone who's partial or non-weight bearing, they're going to get weak. Their muscles are going to get um, a lot smaller. So we're trying to prevent this atrophy as much as possible. So we focus on the quads, hamstrings, and calves. I'm also a huge fan of blood flow restriction training early on. If you've never heard of BFR, it's a way to increase your strength and muscle mass at a similar rate as regular weight training with only 20% of the loads you would normally use. Excuse me, 20% of your maximal uh, one rep max. So in traditional weight training, you need somewhere around 80% of your one rep max to make strength improvements. With BFR, it's only 20%. Obviously, that's really nice because after you've had a surgical repair, you can't load the hip very much, right? So we can improve strength and hypertrophy at a similar rate just by adding the BFR. 
Okay. Just make sure you have a green light from your doctor. I personally want to make sure those incisions are dry and healing. And after we do BFR, they aren't seeping. Okay. Uh, generally, when I put the BFR strap on for most of my patients, the strap actually goes right below the portal holes. So we don't end up causing much issue there. And then the other part is that you want to make sure you have a green light from the doc, right? And usually for me, this is around two weeks. Okay. Could you start earlier? Probably. Um, I just tend to wait a little bit just to be as safe as possible, although I might not need to, right? What else are we thinking about from a strength perspective? Well, for one, we can train the contralateral limb. What can we do? We can do things like single legged deadlifts, single legged squats, calf raises, and most of this is done as tolerated. So it's important to understand that when someone is partial or non-weight bearing, the contralateral limb is doing all the work. Okay. Uh, so super common for these folks to start developing pain in the contralateral knee, hip, elsewhere. You just have to be a little bit cautious. You don't want to go nuts on the contralateral limb just because it's the only area you can train. You can very easily go too far and keep in mind that limb is already taking extra stress because it's doing all the work currently. All right. From a conditioning perspective, we're starting off with upright bike work for around 20 minutes per day. We can just ramp that up over the course of time as well tolerated. And initially we're starting with no resistance at all. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to see this image or on the video podcast, you'll be able to see this image, right? Uh, if you're not, and you're listening to the audio, I apologize. I recommend going to YouTube at some point and checking this out, but I just have the basic daily exercise and conditioning written down. So this is exactly what we ended up giving to the patient. So you can see we have glute bridges, bent knee fallouts for the adductors, sideline ball squeezes for the adductors, sideline clamshell, sideline reverse clamshell, cat cows cat cow position overhead reaches with core bracing and then standing hip abduction and extension. So early on, I want my patients to be doing these exercises frequently. I think that's great for range of motion. It makes people feel like they're um, moving a little bit, which I think is helpful. And these sets and reps are usually one to two, but again, we're doing this multiple times a day. So you may be looking at, you know, a total of six sets per day, somewhere between like three and six sets per day total, but they're all spread out, you know, morning, evening, and then lunchtime if someone can get them in. Lastly, we have the conditioning, just the bike work we talked about previously. What does treatment look like at week three to six? Okay. So going back to range of motion, usually the restrictions are lifted at this point. And for this patient, they were. Okay. So we're doing passive, passive range of motion in all directions and very light stretching. So we have to be cautious in hip extension as well as hip flexion and internal rotation, especially when you combine the two, right? So hip flexion in general can be a little iffy. If you do a flexion and internal rotation, that can be pretty dang provocative. So very gentle ranges of motion and no aggressive stretching at this point. One of the things that I tell my students that I work with on a regular basis is that, hey, you had this surgery and actually remove some bone on the femoral neck. In theory, that actually promotes increased range of motion, we don't have to force that range of motion early on because A, it tends to come back and B, they remove some bones. So there's probably increased range of motion just a result of the surgery. Okay. We also continue doing soft tissue work. So again, TFL, rectus femoris, adductors, glute medius, and max. And we're expecting, I'm, I'm saying expecting in quotations, full range of motion by week six to eight, right? Now, my experience having full range of motion at week six to eight, is not always reasonable. I think you will still see limitations in combined hip flexion and internal rotation and sometimes a little bit of extension, but really the combined combination of internal rotation and flexion over the course of time. Uh, and what I find is that this tends to get better with time and light mobility. So I don't, I don't push it because it, I found that if you push mobility too early on, it just makes people really sore and that sets them up into a really negative spiral of always being painful, not being able to advance, getting frustrated, all sorts of bad stuff. So I wouldn't push the range of motion aggressively. What does strength work look like at week three to six? So we're increasing strength all over the place. We're still limited in this individual because he's partial weight bearing. For other patients, they're actually starting to weight bear at this point. We can be a little bit um, more progressive with things like squatting and deadlifting. But right now, we, we just can't. We're listening to what the doctor has to say. We're being cautious not to step any boundaries. Okay. So at this stage, we start strengthening the hip flexors. Now, this is very important because in folks that have FAI, so prior to surgery, they generally are weaker in the hip flexion. And then having the surgery, right, in the front portion of the hip, getting that swelling, getting that inflammation, having that pain, and then not doing any exercise for several weeks makes that super duper weak. So we need to make sure we get that strength back. 
We just have to do it very carefully because if you do too much, too soon, too high intensity, you create more soreness, you slow yourself down, all sorts of bad stuff happens, right? In terms of strengthening for the hip, we start with body weight. So think about a body weight resisted clamshell, just the weight of your leg you're lifting. And we start adding band resistance and or ankle weight. So think about sideline leg lifts, sideline hip abduction. We just put an ankle weight on the ankle and we get stronger over the course of time. Okay. For standing hip extension abduction, I will stand on that contralateral limb, that non-surgical side, put a band around the knees, and then work some hip extension and abduction on the surgical leg, right? We're also still thinking about the accessory muscles, so the quads, the hamstrings, and calves. At this point in rehab, when someone is kind of still confined to the table, they're doing mostly table exercises, I hit them with a crap ton of BFR because we are trying to attenuate that atrophy as much as possible, right? Actively, people are getting weaker and weaker, losing more and more muscle mass. We want to try to reduce that as much as possible. BFR is phenomenal for that. So your patients will probably hate you for a little bit because you're doing so much BFR. But in the long run, I think it's going to really help out. At this point, what does the home program look like? So the daily exercise we talked about before, they got a little bit more challenging. And there's a couple extra ones here, all right? The other piece is that we're only doing these exercises one time per day. We're getting to the point where the exercises are hard enough that if we do it too frequently, it's going to cause too much soreness. So individuals are going to need a little bit more recovery time, right? We have our glute bridges, but now we have some single leg glute, uh, glute bridges. Our bent knee fallouts, we're adding band resistance. We're still doing sideline ball squeezes, sideline clamshells, but we're starting to add some band resistance. Same thing with the reverse clamshells. We have our normal mobility with cat cows and then overhead reaches for the core. Our standing hip abduction extension, we've added a band. And now we have a dead bug progression. So we're starting to train the front part of the hip. We're just giving them the exercise that they tolerate well, right? So if we give them an exercise that's too tough, we just back off a little bit until we find something that doesn't hurt too much while we're exercising. The next day, things aren't all flared up, okay? Conditioning, we still have the bike for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we'll have a discussion about this later, but my athlete is a baseball pitcher. Does he need conditioning? Yes. Does he need the same amount of conditioning as a soccer player? No. So we're not thinking about going crazy from a conditioning perspective. And the other piece you'll see here is now there's a whole bunch of blood flow restriction training, right? So we're doing long arc quads. We're doing bridges with the TRX straps. We're starting to load things up a little bit. We're doing hamstring curls with a cable and the anchor machine, and we're doing calf raises on a slant board. So we're trying to train the rest of the body as much as possible while protecting that healing surgical site. And lastly, we're really hitting that contralateral limb with strength work. So he's doing single legged deadlifts, three sets of 10 with 40 pounds. We're doing single legged squats to a box. We're holding a weight in a goblet position. So we're really trying to load up that contralateral limb as much as possible without aggravating things. So here's what I want you to do next, guys. I have an evidence-based guide to femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, and I've made a cheat sheet from all the key points from it. Okay. We go over all the relevant anatomy with FAI. We go over common mechanisms of injury. We go over radiographic findings. So basically, what does the x-ray say? What does the MRI say when you have FAI and labral pathology? How do you diagnose FAI? What are the best treatments for FAI? What is the prognosis, both with physical therapy, nothing, and also after surgery? Do you do well after surgery? What are the outcomes, right? And lastly, if you compare surgery with physical therapy, which performs better? So I've taken all of these, I've answered all these questions, I've put it in a nice, easy to read format, easy to digest, nice infographic. I'm going to leave that link in the show notes. Definitely check it out. All right. If you want to get that next level with your learning about the hips, this is the next step. That is it for today's episode. Tune in next week where we go over the second half of rehabilitation for hip labral repair. Here are my references. I'll leave all the references in the show notes. If you want to check out that evidence-based um, protocol for hip labral repair, that's reference number one, DOMB et al. And if you guys want to see the protocol that I tend to use quite a bit uh, from a local surgeon by the name of Thomas Wirtz, I left that as uh, reference number four. You can check that out because that's, that's generally the one that I end up following. But again, I think it's super important that you, A, Talk to the surgeon, figure out what the protocol is. And if you have any questions about how to progress, if you think it's too fast, too slow, you take that up with the surgeon. You don't just make whatever decision you want to. I think that's a bad idea. All right. And lastly, thank you. Thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you weren't watching this right now, I wouldn't be able to do this. All right. I wouldn't be able to make money off of it. I wouldn't be able to share. Right. I, um, I really appreciate it so much. You know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up. 
leave a comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts. How do you do your rehabilitation with FAI patients? Do I do something differently? Do you disagree, agree? Let me know. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, please consider doing that. If you're watching this via podcast, please consider giving me a positive rating and review. Helps out a ton. If you want to go that extra step, either with learning, right, or support, uh, supporting me, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain Free Insiders. I'll leave a link in the show notes. But if you want to check it out, go to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders online library. It's just a dollar to get started and $12.99 a month after that. Thank you very much, guys.